Hello and welcome to our, the Partnership for Food Safety Education's webinar about the upcoming holidays. We're calling it Turkey Time, your Thanksgiving Food Safety Overview. We're so glad you're here and we're really excited to be featuring today the top 10 consumer questions that come into the meat and poultry hotline. So let's get started. Um, thanks again for being here and we have a lot of great stuff to cover. Uh, this webinar is being sponsored by the Nonprofit Partnership for Food Safety Education. We work to develop and promote effective education programs to reduce foodborne illness risk for consumers. We're a nonprofit organization. We rely on grants and donations um, to operate, and we welcome all the backfighters today who have joined us. I'm Shelley Feist. I'm Executive Director of the Partnership for Food Safety Education, which many of you know um, our primary website is fightback.org. Uh, let's go through a few important housekeeping matters first. One important thing is we love you to ask questions. So you will see on the right hand side um, in the box choices, you should see one that says questions. You can enter your question at any time during the webinar and we will get to a number of them towards the end of the webinar. So feel free to send a question. I'd also ask you to consider as we go through the content, you'll see we're talking about your food safety outreach, your media outreach. So if you have some tips or um, something you're really proud of that you're doing to promote holiday food safety, that's another thing you can put in the question box. After the webinar, you will receive a brief survey. These surveys really help us improve what we offer to you in free webinars. So please fill out that um, survey. It is very important um, feedback for us. Many of you have the opportunity to earn continuing education units. So I want to take a moment to go through how you get your CEU certificate. We aren't able to answer emails about this because we don't have staff who can <laughs> answer all of them. But here's, we've made it super easy so you can get your CEU certificate. If you look here under handouts on the sidebar, there are three CEU certificate handouts, and then there's a great social media calendar that we've developed for you. Those are all things you can download right now from the webinar. In the follow-up email, we will also send you a link to get the CEU certificate. So that's another place you can get them. And then once this webinar is posted as a recorded event on our website at fightback.org, you will be able to get the CEU certificates there too. So those are three easy ways to get your CEU certificate. We're going to start off with a poll to just find out who has joined us today. So please um, take a moment. Um, Michelle will launch the poll and we'll leave it open for a little bit. Take a moment to let us know uh, what is your profession. Okay, have you answered the poll? Please answer the poll right now. And Michelle, why don't you show us who's here today? Oh, wow. Hello, Cooperative Extension and the Nutrition and Dietetics. Great. We're so glad you're here. And thank you for taking a moment to answer the poll. I wanted to point out that we have a webinar that was recorded in September, the September 12th, and we went into a whole bunch of abundance of content that was available through uh, Story of Your Dinner, which is our current campaign. So I just want to emphasize that if you want more depth on um, that content, to please 
check out this webinar um, recorded September 12th. Um, it's also a great resource for you because we put all our webinars there and they're always available for you to view on that uh, events page. That brings us to our guest speaker today. Our guest speaker is Marianne Gravely. She's Senior Technical Information Specialist with the USDA Meat and Poultry Hotline. She joined the hotline in 1988. She provides consumers with safe food handling guidance daily through phone, live chat, and email inquiries. And she's one of the people behind the very um, effective uh, virtual representative called F. Karen who answers food safety questions. She also researches and writes materials for the Food Safety and Inspection Service website and um, deals with media inquiries. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in home economics with an emphasis in foods and nutrition from Hood College and a master's degree in human nutrition and foods from Virginia Tech. She's worked as a public health nutritionist. She supervised a WIC nutrition program in Virginia, and she was a home ec economist um, at the Yokosuka Naval Base in Japan. We've asked her to be with us today to highlight common holiday food safety concerns and questions that come into the hotline from consumers. So I think in that way, it's great for all of us to hear, you know, what are things that consumers um, are most concerned about? when it comes to holiday food preparation. So thank you, Marianne, for being with us. Thank you, Shelley. It's my pleasure. All right, well, let's get started. Um, these are the top 10 questions that we get on the USDA's meat and poultry hotline. Um, this time of year, people start calling us about their turkeys. So um, let's go with the first question which is when should you buy your turkey? Well, that depends. Are you buying a fresh or a frozen turkey? If you're buying a frozen turkey, you can buy it any time, but you need to allow enough time for it to thaw. If you're buying a fresh turkey, first check the date on the turkey and see when is the best buy date, the use by date, the user freeze by date, and make sure you'll be cooking it before that date expires. If there is no date on the turkey, then wait until two days before you're going to cook it. Next slide. What size turkey should I buy? You want to allow about a pound of turkey per person. That will give you ample servings plus enough turkey for leftovers. But the larger the turkey, the greater the yield. A turkey, a turkey that is larger than 16 pounds will actually lead yield two servings per pound. So a 12-pound turkey will feed 12 people, and a 20-pound turkey will feed 40 people. Next slide. How long can you keep a turkey in the freezer? This is the number one question we get on the meat and poultry hotline. Food poisoning bacteria does not grow in the freezer. So no matter how long any food is frozen, it will be safe. A turkey will keep its best quality for a full year, but it's safe as long as it's frozen. So if you still have a turkey in your freezer from last year, it's fine to use it this year. Next slide. How do I safely thaw my turkey? The safest way to thaw a turkey is in the refrigerator. You want to allow one day for every five pounds of weight. Once it's thawed, it's safe for two more days. So if your refrigerator runs cold, you, might, you may wish to add two days to the thawing time. So for example, a 12 pound turkey will take about three days to thaw, but you could put it in the refrigerator five days before you need to use it. You can also thaw a turkey in cold water, fill your sink or a large container with the cold water, and then you wanna change the water every 30 minutes, replacing it with more cold water. A 12 pound turkey will thaw in about six hours. Finally, you can use the defrost function on your microwave. Be sure to rotate the turkey periodically so it thaws evenly. Check your microwave manual for instructions on how best to do that. Um, when you're using the microwave method, keep an eye on the turkey because things like the tips, you know, the edges may start to cook. Um, if you are using the cold water 
or microwave method for thawing your turkey, you must proceed to cook it immediately. As soon as it's thawed, go ahead and start cooking it. Now, one thing to know is it's perfectly safe to cook a turkey from the frozen state. It'll take one and one half times the normal cooking time to cook a turkey that is solidly frozen. If the turkey's just a bit icy, then it'll just take a little bit longer to cook. You don't have to, you know, thaw it if you don't want to. Start cooking the turkey, and then once it's cooked enough, just use some tongs to pull the giblets out of that turkey. Next slide. Is it safe to wash a turkey? It is absolutely not safe or recommended to wash a turkey. Any bacteria present will be killed by cooking, so there's no reason to wash the turkey. There are some bacteria that are so tightly attached to the turkey skin that no matter how many times you wash the turkey, the bacteria will not be removed. However, there are other bacteria that are very loosely attached and they can spread up to two feet around your kitchen. That means that bacteria will contaminate the clean dishes in your dish drainer, your dish towel, your soap dispenser. Um, so it's just really not recommended to wash the turkey. Now, it is difficult to, you know, the turkey is large, so people do tend to put it in their sink, um, you know, take it out of the package. If you're going to do that, have the roasting pan right next to your sink so that you can just pull the turkey out of the packaging and place it right in the roaster and you're ready to go. Next slide. What's the safe way to stuff a turkey? Well, for optimum safety, we recommend cooking the turkey outside. I'm sorry, we recommend cooking the stuffing outside the turkey. Your turkey will cook faster and more evenly. But if you choose to stuff the turkey, we recommend preparing the stuffing immediately before you stuff the turkey and then stuff the turkey right before you put it in the oven. It's not safe to stuff the turkey in advance and it's not safe to prepare the stuffing in advance. When you do cook the turkey, the stuffing has got to reach an internal temperature of 165 degrees. So you may have to cook the turkey longer so that the stuffing reaches a safe internal temperature. Next slide. Can I cook a turkey ahead of time? You can, and it's a good way to save time and maximize the use of your oven on Thanksgiving Day. If you want to cook your turkey in advance, go ahead and cook it, then slice the meat off the bone. You can leave the drumstick, the thighs, and the wings intact, but remove all the breast meat from the bone. Then refrigerate your cooked turkey in shallow containers so that it cools down quickly. You can do this several days in advance. Um, you can also collect the drippings from your turkey and that way you can um, have the, the gravy either prepared in advance so that you're not you know, doing the gravy in the middle of everything else on Thanksgiving Day. Um, then when it comes time to reheat the turkey, reheat it at 325 degrees in a shallow container you can sprinkle it with broth or gravy, cover it with foil. It'll take about 30 minutes, maybe more, to reheat. Make sure it has reached 165 degrees. That way you know it has reached a safe temperature. If you have a way to keep the turkey warm above 140 degrees, you could cook it earlier in the day and then just hold it at 140. But it is not safe to cook the turkey ahead of time and leave it at room temperature. Next slide. How long will it take my turkey to cook and how can I tell if the turkey is done? The only way to tell that your turkey is done is to use your food thermometer. It's done when it has reached 165 degrees in the breast, the innermost part of the thigh, and the wing area. The pop-up timer that most turkeys come with nowadays is accurate, but with a thermometer, you can check all parts of the bird, plus it gives you an idea how your turkey is progressing. So, you know, as the turkey is cooking, you can check it. Um, you can tell, oh, it's going to be done pretty soon. Time to get all the side dishes ready. Um, but it's also very important just to know for your peace of mind that the turkey has reached a safe internal temperature. We do get a lot of calls from people after Thanksgiving who have been carving their turkey and they found the part of it that was pink 
at 165 degrees, there are parts of the turkey that might still be pink. If you, if you have used your food thermometer and you cooked it to 165, it doesn't matter what it looks like. You know it has reached a safe internal temperature. A 12-pound unstuffed turkey will take about three hours to cook. A 20-pound turkey will take about four and a half hours. You need to allow another 30 minutes at least for the stuffing. But again, be sure to check the temperature. Check the temperature with your thermometer. Next. Next slide. How do I travel with an uncooked or a cooked turkey? It's easiest to travel with a cold turkey. Put it in the cooler with ice so that you know it's still safe and cold when you reach your destination. If you need to bring a cooked turkey with you, unless you live nearby, it's safest to cook the turkey in advance, slice it from, slice all the meat from the bone and refrigerate it, and then transport that cold turkey in a cooler, then heat it up when you get to your destination. But if you absolutely must transport a hot cooked turkey, first of all, you should only do that if you are close by because it is difficult to keep hot foods hot. And so unless you're, you know, pretty close, you're going to run a risk there that the turkey is going to be at an unsafe temperature. But um, the way to do it would be to uh, take it right from the oven, wrap it up in foil, then newspapers and towels. You may even want to put it in a cardboard box to hold in the heat right before you jump in the car. Um, and then when you get to your destination, make sure that the oven is ready for the turkey so that you can put it right back in the oven and heat it back up so that it stays hot above 140 degrees. Um, next slide. How long will a cooked turkey keep? Well, when the meal is finished, you want to make sure to put all the leftovers away within two hours pack to them in small or shallow containers for rapid cooling. All these cooked foods and leftovers will keep for about four days in your refrigerator. If you freeze them, they will be safe for as long as they're frozen, but they'll taste best if you use them within four months. And that's it. If you have questions about your turkey, or if you want more information, please call our toll-free meat and poultry hotline. We're available Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. We will be open Thanksgiving Day from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. If you call our hotline, you can listen to recorded messages 24 hours a day. Or if you want to speak to us, we're there from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. The number is 888 MP hotline or 888-674-6854. You can also go online to askkaren.gov. Again, you can type in your food safety question um, 24 hours a day and get answers to your questions. If your question isn't there, we have live chat Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. or the Ask Karen has a um, ask a question feature where you will um, Submit your question to us and we will email you back. You can also get information anytime from foodsafety.gov. Marianne, thanks so much. We had one question I thought I'd just cover right now because someone asked about the infographics you showed earlier that USDA has produced about turkeys. Um, can you tell people where to get those infographics? If you go to our website, www.fsis.usda.gov, um, go to the Food Safety Education page, and you should see our Thanksgiving toolkit. Um, if you have any trouble finding any of that, call us on the hotline, and we'll help you find that. But we do have um, graphics that you can use. Um, and we also have, you know, materials, a, a pamphlet called Talking About Turkey that we'd be glad to send you. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. And stick around. We might have some more questions. 
Mm -hmm. uh, this is Shelley, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the material available through Story of Your Dinner and FIPAD.org that might be of most interest to educators to use now. Um, obviously, now is the time to start planning your outreach, and there are a lot of great resources for you to tap into. You, there's no need to reinvent things. Um, I'm going to start with a holiday meal flyer that was created for Story of Your Dinner. You can get it at storyofyourdinner.org. We have a educator page. But as you'll see, this one covers the core four messages and goes into some depth on turkey handling, a little bit on leftovers, conventional uh, oven roast turkey, sort of uh, guidelines um, about timing on that temperature chart, and, and then, of course, the USDA um, Meat and Poultry Hotline, how to reach them. So this flyer is one of the items um, you can get today through storyofyourdinner.org. Download it. It's a great thing to link to for consumers also. Um, next, we have another resource from Story of Your Dinner, several um, one of the things we are doing with Store of Your Dinner is really trying to make food safety built into the joy of preparing food. Um, so we have a, a number of recipes, side dish recipes, that um, include food safety prompts. So these can be printed. Um, you could link to them, uh, again, at storeofyourdinner.org. Um, here's one. We're going to go through a couple of these and then um, show you a video. Each of these recipes has a corresponding um, video also. And we're going to play one of these for you now. Thanks, Michelle. I, don't, I didn't hear the sound. I hope everybody else did. Um, there are recipe videos for all of these recipes. So again, great content to link to. Um, we have another one of Brussels sprouts. That's one you just saw. Um, again, the printable recipe and the video are available. They include food safety prompts, as you saw in the video. So they're unlike other recipes in that they're, they're going to give consumers build the food safety prompts right into the recipe. Our food safety tips flyer is very popular. Um, these also make great social media messages. They're a really easy to understand or, uh, you know, easy visual and a quick message about some of the tips that help consumers reduce risk of food borne illness at home. So food safety tips flyer, another great handout or something you can link to um, that gives a great overview for the consumers in a very simple, simple format. We have added this year um, a whole page of kids activity sheets and the age they're intended for is indicated. Um, they're cute. They've got a kitchen search, um, about the, the do's and don'ts, crossword. So these are great for teachers, too, um, because they are all about food safety basics. Um, so please check those out, again, um, at storeofyourdinner.org. A great thing to use with after-school groups or uh, in the classroom, even, or for parents.
I think we're going to cover one more thing. Ah, yes. Um, as many of you who work in food safety know, uh, raw flour has been implicated in some outbreaks, and there's not a lot of messaging and materials out there about the eating of raw cookie dough and batter. Um, the Home Baking Association has put out some great stuff, and we created this year uh, Food Safety Basics for Baking. Um, it's also, of course, a great message during the holidays. And as you'll see, it talks about how not eating, not to eat batter that contains raw eggs or raw flour. Um, I've seen many recipes online that talk about raw eggs being risky, but um, not raw flour. So this is a great messaging area for people in who are working with consumers on food safety. Next. We have some great social graphics. Um, we will be uh, promoting these during the holidays. You can always retweet or share our posts or create your own posts. Um, feel free to take these uh, social graphics and create your own guidance or web links. Um, a couple that we're really keen on promoting this year include um, reading and following package cooking instructions. There are a lot of recipes now out there that that promote using frozen vegetables, for example, right out of the bag or thawing them without cooking them first. So following package cooking instructions, given the, the so many different types of products, um, is a really great message for the consumer because many manufacturers have greatly improved their instructions for safety at home, um, but consumers aren't necessarily reading them. So. There's that, and of course, you know, defrosting, a um, lot of temptation to defrost one's turkey or other meats and poultry, particularly at room temperature, and that we want to dissuade people from doing that. So you might accompany that with more messaging about what are the safe ways to promote or to defrost um, foods, frozen foods. Next. Clean and separate, um, obviously rinsing fresh fruits and vegetables is important, even though we tell people not to rinse turkey. Um, keep your food separate. Next. Handling of leftovers, really big in the holidays. Also really a lot of receptivity, I think, to leftover messages. So um, why the why it's so important to keep your refrigerator at 40 or below? This is something people don't always know that um, a yeah also that your refrigerator is intended to keep your food cold. Um, so warm food can go in the fridge, but it should be in shallow containers, as Marianne talked about. Um, break your food, your leftovers into more uh, smaller shallow containers and, and not using your leftovers past three to four days. This is an important safety step. So we want to do a lot to promote leftovers. I think that's a great um, message to focus on beginning the day after Thanksgiving to really um, encourage people to use or freeze leftovers. Next. Okay, before I get into um, we're going to we're going to present some great information for you about connecting with your local media because this is such a time of high interest in food safety and you all are the experts in your communities so um, some of you may already do this but this will give you some more background i want to remind you also to please submit your questions um, or submit you know hey yeah, I'm the best food safety educator during the holidays in the United States, and here's some cool stuff I'm doing. Um, so we'd love to hear your stories. Make sure you send us your questions. Um, I also want to, again, point out we connected here at the handouts a social media calendar you can take and use. Um, we've tried to do some of the work to help uh, folks out who are doing all kinds of other um, work in health education get you ready to go. So let's talk a little bit about the action plan because it takes all of us working together and uh, we've talked about some quality content and tools that will support you, but let's also talk about just some other practical ways um, you can do some outreach over the next month or so. 
So in social media, um, share key messages on your social channels. You can copy and paste suggested posts from the social media, ca media calendar that we've attached here. You can customize that text to fit your brand and your content strategy and use your hashtags. Uh, we would encourage you to use hashtag story of your dinner um, if you are using those materials or hashtag food safety. Um, you can also share or repost the posts that we are doing from Facebook or Twitter. We are doing them regularly throughout the holiday season. So there's going to be a lot of content to share. Um, you can also use this content, of course, for other social channels. We are on, fight uh, we're on Facebook and Twitter. Um, you might be on other channels. So that, that is great, and most of it uh, will work for in other channels. Um, again, use that hashtag, serve your dinner. Um, you might want to use hashtag food safety. And those, you know, there's a lot of interest right now in food safety, and even more so as we get closer to Thanksgiving on the part of the consumer. Um, to that end, on the next slide, we um, have a Twitter party. Uh, you can really make some of your people in your community happy because on the Twitter parties, we do prizes that are for consumer attendees, um, meaning organizations that are that are promoting food safety aren't eligible for the prizes, just consumers who participate. So this is a great way for you to look like a hero, invite your uh, community to be on the Twitter chat. They're also a lot of fun because we're going to talk not just food safety, but you know holiday traditions or what people have learned. What are their favorite desserts? Those are some of the things we're going to talk about. So um, join the Twitter party. It won't just be on turkey. It's going to be on other, re our other recipes. It's going to be, as I said, engaging consumers. It's Thursday, November 8th at 4 p.m. Eastern. So mark your calendars for that, especially if you um, really want to join in with some of your experts on um, posting food safety content. Um, encouraging your community to get involved. It's, it's a great chat. Um, so mark your calendars for November 8th, 4 p.m. Eastern, and invite people to be there. Next. We're going to talk briefly about four steps that really help you just do some local media pitching. Um, you may already do media pitching, in which case I'd love to have you again post that to the questions, post it as a comment. Um, but it's not too late to do this. Um, but I would encourage you to do this in the next week or so. Share um, food safety stories with your local newspapers, radio, television. Um, step one would be to identify who these people are. You may already have a media list. You might be able to find them through Google. You might be able to find them through their own website. That's on step two. Often they will have their writers or journalists be accessible by email. So it's fairly easy to find them. Or you might just look for the health reporter, or food reporter. Uh, in step three, why don't you just email them a timely story idea? Say, hey, we have so-and-so is an expert in food safety and health or food safety and nutrition. And uh, you might pitch them on, you'll do a, a recipe and you'll add food safety steps. But a story idea, and we'll talk about a few that um, are kind of ready to roll. Uh, they're probably looking for content that's Thanksgiving themed or holiday themed um, and on safety and good health and nutrition. So on step four, you'll want to follow up again with an email and, and probably a phone call and just say, you know, I sent you an email. I, I think it would be great if, if your channel or your show featured um, food safety for the holidays. And we have an expert on staff who would be available for an interview or a demonstration, that kind of thing. Next page. So this is just to get your mind going about a few angles. Of course, you guys will know many angles, but some that we talked about today are just turkey safety, you know? 
how, what are the things consumers most want to know about a turkey? And, you know, it's pretty easy to do even a two minute interview that really gives consumers um, a lot of good information on uh, sawing, cooking, preparing their turkey. Food safety basics, um, to say there's, you know, three little known food safety facts. Uh, and they might be that the only way to tell if uh, your turkey's done is if you measure it with a food thermometer. It might be don't wash your turkey because that causes cross contamination. All kinds of those basics. Um, baking might be a good thing this year, again, because we really need to do more to get out the message about um, how eating raw cookie dough and raw batter can be dangerous, especially for children. So that's a timely message during the holidays about baking and um, not eating those raw ingredients. And then leftovers, another great topic. How to use leftovers. Maybe you've got some recipes about uh, using leftover uh, sweet potatoes or turkey or stuffing. Um, we could talk about how that helps you manage leftovers, um, can reduce food waste or, you know, keeps you on budget to, to use all the great food you made for the meal. So those are a few story strategies you might you might want to pitch. So before we go into our questions, and I want to again encourage you to submit questions about anything Marianne covered or anything I covered, or again, just what are you up to? We'd love to hear it. Um, which of these resources, what, what resources are you most likely to use for holiday food safety outreach? We'll take this poll and leave it open for about 30 seconds. So please take the poll so we can get a sense of what you're planning to use. All right, have you taken the poll? We'll keep it open another 10 seconds. If you have not taken it, give us your attention for 10 seconds so we can all hear what is a source for you this year um, for your holiday food safety outreach. Okay, Michelle, if you could close it, show us what people had to say. All right. So there is a lot of interest in Storeview Dinner. That's fantastic. Uh, the agencies have a lot of good resources. So again, if you have questions about that, Marianne can help with that. Uh, a lot of you have your own organization's resources. That's super. Um, tell us a little bit about that, maybe in the comments or question section. Thank you for that. All right, uh, we are going to have um, lots of time for questions or we'll be able to finish before the hour is up. I think that there's just so much going on in food safety this time of year. Um, please let us know how we can support you or um, if you have some really cool ideas that others might be interested in hearing about, about your media outreach or your social media work. Um, be sure to submit. Let me see. Let me go down here and see what's up. Okay. Uh, Debbie and probably others of you are wondering, will a copy of the PowerPoint be available? Uh, we do. We post the recorded webinar. We sometimes post the slides as a PDF. Again, at the recorded webinar page, that's where you would find that. A question from Sandra. Do the videos of the side dishes come in Spanish? They do not this year, no. Um, we have a question from Susan. Can we share these resources in Snap Ad blogs and social media? Yes, please do. Um, and Marianne might have something to say about Snap Ad, but that's, uh, I think things like the recipes um, with the food safety prompts are great. Many of them are simple recipes. Uh, we have a one-page recipe sheet that's just on turkey, and it's pretty much very 
thorough one page thing on roasting a turkey uh, with food safety prompts. Uh, Marianne, did you have anything to add about um, SNAP Ed as a uh, and use of all um, with USDA material through SNAP Ed? If you go to the toolkit, it has a number of um, uh, picture graphics, infographics that you can download and print. Um, you can also just go directly to our Flickr page, and we have infographics on a variety of subjects. But but the toolkit itself does have um, Thanksgiving holiday turkey safety infographics that you can download. We also have materials that you can call us to order, or you can go on our website to the fact sheets page and look for things. Almost all of them are available as a PDF that you can download. But if you need help with that, just call the hotline and we can direct you through it. Thank you. One of the things we posted for educators at storyviewdinner.org, again, educate, health educator page, is a um, like a draft press release that's all intended to be um, personalized. That makes a blog article. Uh, several people have used that. Um, so there's material you can use and edit to your liking. Yes. Here's a question, Marianne, for you. And we don't often talk about holding temps because that's not really a concept we tend to talk about at home food safety. But Lisa asked, you know, about holding temp with a turkey and how long can you safely hold the meal, I guess, in the oven? Um, what would you say about that, Marianne? Is that something you're asked much? Sure. You know, once the food is cooked, if it's just sitting on the counter, room temperature, we say use it within two hours. But if you hold it, at 140 degrees or higher, then it's safe indefinitely because it's out of the danger zone. So if you want to hold hot foods in your oven, you know, set the oven lower so that it maintains 140 or higher, the food will stay at a safe temperature. So 140 is the temperature, you know, food needs to be either 40 degrees or colder, so in the refrigerator, or above 140 degrees if you're going to hold it hot. Right. Anything between 40 and 140 uh, just helps bacteria grow. <laughs> just right. helps right. them along. Yep. Okay, Marianne, um, what are your thoughts about safety or accuracy of laser type thermometers? Someone is asking. Karen is asking about that. I, I don't have a lot of information on that, but I, I believe they are most useful if you're trying to measure how hot a pan is, how hot the oven is. I don't know that they're that accurate for measuring the food because, you know, with a turkey, you're you're measuring the internal temperature. You're inserting the probe of your thermometer deep into the turkey to see how hot it is down inside. And I don't know that those lasers can penetrate through the food. I think they're mainly used to tell if your pan's hot enough, if your oven's hot enough. Thank you for that. Um, as these kinds of new tools come on the market, I'm sure you'll get more questions to the hotline about them. <laughs> yeah. uh, Caitlin asks, if purchasing an already pre-cooked frozen poultry, pre-kicked and frozen. Do I need to reheat to 140 or to 165 degrees? The label um, on a product she's looking at states 140, but I thought to reheat it, it needs to be 165. This is from Caitlin. Um, Marianne, I'd love you to address that. Okay, Caitlin. If the Label says 140, then then that's what you can feel safe with. You know, that's coming from a USDA inspected plant. We have prior label approval, so the manufacturer has to demonstrate, you know, that what they are doing is safe. Um, if there is no instruction or if you are reheating, you know, your own leftovers, then the general rule is to reheat to 165 degrees. But but if you have a product from a USDA inspected plant that says 140, then that's fine. 
that's perfectly safe. Sometimes you see that with hams, where uh, um, a fully cooked ham will say heat until 140. Um, if it's coming from an inspected plant or it has instructions from the manufacturer, you can follow that. Otherwise, just go go by the 165 degrees rule. Okay, thanks. All right, I'm gonna go up here, see if there's some more questions. We got a lot of good questions, thank you guys. Okay. Here's a question, how long can you keep Thanksgiving leftovers? That's probably worth repeating. We would say three to four days. That's right. And um, to the great thing about the three to four days is at that point you either reheat and eat them or freeze them. So you can still freeze things, but really you shouldn't wait past three to four days. Um, Jill asks, do you re recommend resting a turkey after cooking? Yes, Marianne, um, let, it, let, it, let it sit for about 20 minutes after it comes out of the oven. Now, if you have stuffed the turkey, go ahead and remove the stuffing, but cover the turkey with foil and then just let it rest. At that point, you're probably going to be making gravy or putting other casseroles in the oven to heat up, so that's fine. And then when 20 minutes has passed, then you can go ahead and slice it. That just gives the juice is time to settle back into the bird and the, the the heat to completely equalize. But yes, resting about 20 minutes is a good idea. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a question from Holly. I've seen recipes using raw flour in the end product. Part of the instructions are to quote, bake the flour prior to adding it into the product. Is this a safe practice? So what I understand about flour, which um, is a raw product, uh, but there haven't been um, instructions that I'm aware of that have been verified for home, you know, quote, heat treatment of the flour. Um, so one could do this and follow what these recipes are saying about you know, baking the flour before you use it as flour. I would say, to my knowledge, they haven't been, been verified these instructions to prove that they they do or they are a kill step, food safety step. Um, I would say it's generally better idea to just uh, bake whatever the product is, or if you have at risk people in your household. So if you have young children or someone who's particularly immune compromised, you know, as a safety matter, you may not want to make recipes that have raw flour or raw eggs or, you know, just be more careful about raw products um, for those family members. Um, Marianne, here's a question from Renee for you. When microwaving to thaw, what would you recommend one puts on wing tips to prevent overcooking the wings? Um, you can wrap the wing tips with foil um, uh, as long as you have more food than you have foil um, you're not going to to cause a problem but you know of course check check and make sure you don't get any sparking but for that small amount you could put a little bit of foil over the the wing tips um, the other thing you could do um, is start thawing it and then you know just cut them off um, and, and let them thaw, you know, as they cook. It won't take very long at all. Um, and also, you know, I think what I would do is probably, you know, maybe microwave it for five or ten minutes, let it rest, microwave it again, so that you have some resting time throughout the thawing process to let the temperature equalize, so that you don't have one part that's, you know, thawed and cooked while the other part of the turkey is still really frozen. Okay, thanks. Now here's a tricky question from Erin. When keeping the refrigerator 40 degrees, which is correct, that's great, I notice the food often freezes when it gets full. So the more full ref refrigerator can lead to freeze spots, according to Erin. This means the turkey almost always stays frozen. 
I guess she may be referring to when you're trying to thaw the turkey. Does the large icy turkey lower the refrigerator temperature significantly? Should I raise the refrigerator temperature a few degrees to compensate for the turkey? I would think it's better to plan more time rather than to adjust the fridge's temperature. What 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 would you say, Marianne? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I have a cold refrigerator, so I always add, you know, two days or more to, to my expected thawing time. You know, it's risky to raise the temperature because you might raise it too much. Um, refrigerators work better if there's room for the air to circulate. So if you know this is going to be a problem and you don't have an extra refrigerator, um, you might consider just taking some of the food out of the refrigerator that doesn't need to be there. So if you have, you know, fruits and vegetables or um, if you're keeping beverages in the refrigerator because you like them cold, you know, during this time when you have a lot of food in the refrigerator, you might want to remove those. So you just have more space for the air to move around. Um, one of our tips for people as they prepare for the holidays is to clear out their refrigerator, go through it and, you know, get rid of things that you're not using. If you have an extra refrigerator, of course, then you can, you have a place for it to go. But come Thanksgiving, we need all the space we can get in our refrigerator. So if you have things in there that are just taking up space, then, you know, move those out. And that might help with the circulation in the refrigerator, which might help with the thawing. But I would not adjust the temperature. Yeah. I think one of the most important things, if you're having a big holiday meal you're making at home, is that pre-planning. You know, maybe... Maybe don't buy some of your perishables until, you know, the day before if you're thawing your turkey, for example. I think it's an important thing about kind of controlling <laughs> your refrigerator so they can do the job for you. Thanks, Marianne. Um, Denise asked, did you say turkey's done at 155 or 165? It's 165. In fact, what's wonderful about the turkey safe roast in temperature of 165 is about as the temperature for all poultry. Um, so that makes it convenient. All right. You might get your questions in. We're going to just do a couple more and I think we'll make sure everybody gets back to their back to their desk. Uh, Alyssa asked if there's a way at the end of the year to see how many residents of their state use Store of Your Dinner resources. Well, Alyssa, that raises a really cool question, which I want to invite you all. Um, if you're an educator that's interested in being part of a evaluation of Store of Your Dinner, it's a related pitch I'm making here, you, um, we have a evaluation going on and we're looking for educators who want to be part of that. So. Contact me um, if you're interested in that. We'll give my email before we wrap up here. Um, other than that, we will be look. We will be capturing uh, media uh, placements. Um, hopefully, I'll be doing some interviews and things in November about Story of Your Dinner, and we'll share some of that news with you. Um, there was some talk, a few, maybe a good final question to wrap up with. Um, I guess we only have a couple minutes, Marianne, so I don't know if you could quickly even address this. Um, it's about like fresh wild turkeys or fresh from the farm turkeys. You know, I know a lot of people are concerned that they feel they should be washed or rinsed. Um, they may not have gone through some kind of a, you know, cleansing bath or something in the production. Is there anything you'd add about, you know, fresh from the farm? raw turkey they still have to go through a, either a usda or a state inspected slaughter process so it, it still is going to be safe but but the same thing would apply anything any bacteria present is going to be killed by cooking you are not going to make the turkey safer 
by washing it, but you run the risk of contaminating your kitchen. So I, I wouldn't treat that turkey differently than, than any turkey that you buy at the grocery store. Yeah, all right. Well, there's so many good questions. Uh, the website from that Marianne mentioned is just, if you go to USDA FSIS, what is it, USDA FSIS? <laughs> um, Food Safety and Inspection Service. So right. F is in food, S for safety, I inspection, S for safety. So it's fsis.usda.gov. .gov, yes. There's a lot of great stuff there, and they have great consumer stuff. Um, you know, a couple of the questions that were posted talk about the, for example, the leftovers. We say three to four days. The reason you might see differences between leftovers and um, temperatures, there are there are different guidelines for consumer than for food service. So if you work in food service, you might notice that sometimes, that some of the consumer advice is some slightly different. Um, that's kind of often because there's more like an abundance of caution with the consumer um, or, you know, a temperature is slightly rounded up or what have you but yes acknowledging there are differences and that is not a that's not because there's a mistake but um there are some differences um all right well let's go on to the next slide i want to thank you all for your questions uh, we have some visitors from the home baking association saying they have resources yes they have some great resources um, about flour and baking safety this um, season so check their stuff out um, next slide please Uh, we've talked a little bit about fightback.org as a resource. Um, we have lots of free downloads. Uh, we have everything from Produce Pro, Don't Wing It, Story of Your Dinner, uh, Babies and Toddlers, a great campaign we did this summer, uh, Go 40 or Below. Um, we show that flyer here. The refrigerator temperature issue is very important, especially for people who are immune compromised. Um, and not keeping leftovers too long. You know, that's a great message for elderly folks who live alone. Um, between their their refrigerator and, and leftovers, um, you know, keeping, making sure food is safe is very important for people who are immune compromised. So check out fightback.org for more resources. All of them are free to use. Um, next slide. The Story of Your Dinner is a campaign now in its third year, the first pilot year um, we were building it. This year is our third year, and we are very uh, grateful to Ardent Mills uh, Cargill, Costco Wholesale, and the Frozen Food Foundation for their support to make possible the Story of Your Dinner. With their support, we're able to produce the videos, the recipes, all the great handouts, the kids' activities. So we thank them for their support. Next. We also enjoy the support of some of the leading companies and industry associations um, in the food industry, Cargill, ConAgra, the FMI Foundation, NSF International, um, the Produce Marketing Association, and Tyson. We thank them for the support of the Partnership for Food Safety Education because without them, we would not be able to uh, produce all this great content and have you visiting with us. So thank you to them. Next. Our partners, again, run the gamut of the leading um, professional associations, uh, food companies, uh, the liaisons from the USDA, the FDA, the CDC, um, USDA um, Food Safety and Nutrition, or yes, Food Safety, <laughs> Food Safety and Inspection Service. Um, also, FSN, the food, the food and Nutrition, and FNS, the Food and Nutrition Service. So, as you see, we have many, many experts in food safety who work uh, together to get this information out to consumers. So, thank you to them. I think my next slide is just a, a reminder to you. Um, remember to get your CEU certificates. Uh, we aren't able to address your emails, but 
we make it so easy to get your CEU certificate by either getting it right here, right now, before we close, uh, in your follow-up email, or when the event is posted to the event recording page, the webinar recording page, which we do quite quickly. Uh, thank you um, for participating and earning your CEUs with our webinars. We love to have you with us. Um, thank you. We are working away, and some of you might be planning to come. Um, we are working away now to get registration launched uh, very shortly for From Consumers to Chefs, which is the Consumer Food Safety Education Conference. USDA will be doing some great stuff at this conference, presenting and a pre-conference workshop. Uh, so hold the date, March 6th through 8th, we will be at the lovely Swan and Dolphin Resort in Orlando, uh, and we will be having an intensive uh, two days on improving consumer food safety education. Great tools, great ideas, demonstrations, speakers to motivate you. Um, so please get this on your calendar. Hold the date. A uh, reminder, a survey will pop up. Please take it. It gives us terrific feedback. And then next, I think we have just a slide to, uh, so you can reach me and reach Marianne. Marianne, thank you so much again. It's really fun to have you with us. Oh, thank you. It was my pleasure. We answered a lot of good questions. And remember to use the Meat and Poultry Hotline not only for your own questions, but to refer your um, community for great food safety advice during the holidays. Thanks again for being with us. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you at the conference and uh, early in 2019 when we start our next webinar series. So thank you very much.